You know, I'm a big, the, the engineer in me always wants to define the problem before I try to solve it. And so uh, I always like to do testing when possible. That's why you saw so many blue dots on the map, because I want to be there and hear it and test it myself. And so uh, testing a room is so important. And, and to diagnose the issues that you have, that's one thing, because how do you solve a problem unless you know exactly what's going on? Um, uh, but it also, uh, you know, some computer modeling can be limited. You know, if, if the, for one, if you get blueprints, that's not always how it was actually built. Like so, I, when I'm on site, I'm taking physical measurements too to make sure that my models are correct. Um, but while you're doing testing, and, and I encourage you guys, like omnidirectional measurement microphones aren't expensive. You can get them for like $99, or um, and and you can get like Room EQ Wizard, which is a software program that's free, um, and start testing rooms and and just seeing what differences uh, happen when you move a microphone around and things like that because. All, all you're doing is you're learning while you're doing that, and it'll help you in your next project or in your next studio that you're in. Um, so, and typically, when you have your room tested and you have everything done right, uh, obviously hiring a consulting firm like ourselves or others, it, it, there's an expense to that, but typically it saves money in the long, long run. I, I can't tell you how many projects I've been involved with that I at least saved them a, as much as our fee was in just silly mistakes they would have made or or uh, just using one material over another where it was going to do the same thing uh, but one cost four times as much or something like that. So there's there's a uh, real benefit to having the rooms tested. When we do test rooms, uh, we'll look at the frequency domain. Uh, one of the really important things, obviously, we want to make sure the frequency response is good. And I put a frequency response of a typical bedroom studio in the low end. So we have from 40 to 400 hertz. And I didn't go out and find the worst bedroom possible. It's just a standard size bedroom. Unfortunately, most bedrooms are divisible by uh, four feet because that's what the sheet of drywall is. You know, so they'll have ten foot or, or twelve foot by twelve foot or twelve foot by sixteen foot. Um, you usually want to avoid that in acoustics. Like at my first home when I bought it, I bought it, uh, well, we built the home and I picked the model that had an 11 foot by 15 foot room uh, because I was like, that's going to be my studio. <laughs> and uh, But you want to try to get dimensions that aren't divisible by the same number or each other. Like vocal booths that are four foot by four foot by eight foot, you might as well tear them down and try to build something else. They just sound so bad. Um, same thing like eight foot by 16 foot by eight foot. Anything like that, um, uh, repeatable dimensions is not good. But you see this room, I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't race to mix a song in a room like this. You know, you'd have some struggles. You have so many peaks and dips in the frequency spectrum that um, that's what it sounds like at your mix position. So you're going to make all these adjustments. Uh, one thing I like to point out is that dip that happens around 60, 70 hertz there, which is about um, about 15 decibels lower than the average. Uh, that's kick drum, right? So you would constantly boost that kick drum until it sounded even where you're sitting. You take a mix out to your car and the kick drum's slamming everybody in the face. So uh, that's not what you want. You want to have a more consistent, uh, smooth frequency response. You're never going to get a straight line. You know, that's not something that, that happens uh, very often. Uh, typically in this frequency range, if you can get plus or minus five decibels, so a 10 dB swing from lowest uh, a dip to the highest peak, that would be a win. Um, like the best room, I, have, I think I have a slide on here, but the best room that we've done frequency response wise was a, a room out in California for Church of Scientology where budget was not a problem. Um, and they basically said they wanted the best sounding room in LA and no pressure, right? Um, but uh, we did all sorts of crazy things. I'll show you pictures of it, but it was in this frequency range, it was plus or minus a dB and a half. So three dB change. Um, and people would pay for that, and they did. Um, so, but not everybody have the means to do something like that. So, plus or minus five dB is great. Um, this shows the full frequency spectrum of a different room. Uh, again, uh, you have the low end is is uh, very erratic, and then you have comb filtering in the high end, which is just a, a phase cancellation from reflections arriving in close proximity to the direct sound, and then you get the, this uh, uh, comb filtering effect in the top. But there's there's hope for rooms. Like this, this room, I actually did this one completely remotely, um, where they just sent me blueprints. I actually sent them a, a, a sign signal where they recorded it in their room, and then I could post-process it and, and get frequency response back, so it saves budget for, for uh, travel costs and things like that. But the green line was before and the blue line was after, which that's a huge improvement, you know, and, and that was done completely remotely, just doing things in the right way and, and testing it beforehand. 